Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Alex Ruthman, and I'm uh, helping facilitate and work with the Play With Your Music course. And today we're happy to start off with our first live interview with uh, Alex Case from the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Uh, hi, Alex. Hello. Great. Um, I brought in Alex. Alex is uh, uh, known around uh, the world, actually, as an audio F expert, uh, as he calls it. Uh, he has a wonderful blog at uh, recordingology.com. We'll put the links to all these uh, in the comments afterwards. Uh, and also has some wonderful tutorials on lynda.com, which we'll be linking to later in the course. Um, very active in the Audio Engineering Society and also uh, brings, in addition to his audio and musician chops, um, brings a lot of credibility and experience um, as an acoustician uh, and currently is a, a fellow of the Acoustical Society of America. So he's this wonderful, I'm really uh, glad to have him here today to talk with all of us. Uh, because he's, he works at this wonderful intersection of, of art, music, and science together. And I thought he would be a wonderful person to bring in to start off our discussion about um, the creative pro processes and practices of engineers and producers, and, but particularly focusing on how and why and how, what is sound and what is space and, and how can we start working with it. Because our first module here with uh, Play With Your Music is focused on critical listening and recording analysis. Uh, we're spending time listening for sounds and identifying timbres in a recorded piece of music, how we perceive them in space, both left and right and far and near, uh, and then also starting to build some descriptive language around how can we describe the sounds that we hear in recordings uh, so that we can better communicate uh, with musicians we might be working with, uh, so we can better understand um, you know, the creative effects and the technical means for achieving musical results in audio recording. So uh, to get started here, I guess I'll, uh, I'd like to shift it over to Alex here. Is there anything you'd like to say uh, at the beginning before we dive into the question? Sure. Uh, first of all, good morning. I mean, it's nine in the morning and we have to talk about music. I want you to know that's not typical for most people. Uh, we, our creative juices kick in, you know, in about eight or twelve hours. So to all of you watching this, this uh, later in the evening, you're in the better mood for this, the right mood for this. Um, I guess one thing I wanted to say is that, uh, that music, you know, if, if the music is an orchestra or a trio or a power rock trio sort of thing, the, uh, the instruments take care of a lot of things themselves. What the musicians choose to play, it all happens in a space with the sound of those instruments. But when you get to this stage where you want to make music yourself and you're basically creating something that's only realized through loudspeakers, you now have much more variable, you have many more variables than happen in nature really. You have the chance to do things that a band can't do. And so we have to, we have to get really in control of all these variables because it's too easy to accidentally make a mess of things. So what a trio or orchestra is sort of self-correcting for once we sit down in a digital audio workstation, we can end up crowding things, putting in too many sounds, putting in sounds that don't go together. So I think part of what we're going to talk about now is how you get kind of analytical sometimes about it. What happens naturally and musically, we have to get a little bit more analytical to make sure it works out for our loudspeaker creations. So I think we, we face a special challenge when we do that. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Uh, I guess a good place to start would be just... Um, maybe at the beginning with uh, what do we need to know as musicians and engineers and, and creative audiophiles uh, about sound itself? Uh, what do we need to know about the structure and how sound itself operates? If, if you look at the audio waveform in, on a computer in whatever application you have available to you, this, I'm talking about the squiggly lines that go up and down left to right across your screen, it's sort of humbling and inspiring, I think, to realize that that's your whole art. Sound is this thing changing over time. And when it's sound in the air, that thing changing is air pressure. And when it's recorded on a disc, it's numbers that describe amplitude. But our entire art form lives in those two dimensions, time and amplitude. And the pattern of changes, looking at it makes almost no sense, but the pattern of changes is what separates beautiful art from regular okay music. So all sound is is a changing pressure wave over time. 
uh, but it's full of exquisite detail and wonderful timbres, emotions, stories, all that stuff can live there. So that sound changing over time, the slowest changes that we can hear are around 20 hertz, which is to say they change, they cycle 20 times a second, and the fastest changes we can usually hear are when they cycle 20,000 times a second, 20,000 hertz. So I, I don't know if this is too technical for what you want to be talking about, but having 20 to 20,000 hertz, that is, that is our frequency axis. That is the range of frequencies through which all of our instruments have to fit. Kick and bass down low, cymbals and, and the metallic sound of a steel string acoustic guitar up high. So we, we have that narrow range, 20 to 20,000 hertz, in which we have to fit all of, our, all of our art. Great. Yeah, so, I mean, you mentioned there uh, some instruments uh, being at different ends or, or places along the range of, of hearing from, or from, from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Um, could you talk a little bit more, even more technically about that, about um, why is it important that we know where a particular sound has its energy and what frequencies we should we should be listening for the you you it oversimplifies it but you can think of the whole frequency axis as uh, a jigsaw puzzle that we have to fit together with the frequency content of our instruments so if i have a vocal and a piano and a drummer and a bass player i need to think about the frequency ranges of all those instruments and try to fit them together so that they don't overlap. That's the jigsaw puzzle idea. I mean, it's not literally that crisply cut, but it's a good way of thinking about it. There's a term called masking, which describes how one sound becomes more difficult to hear in the presence of another sound. And that's fairly intuitive. When one sound is playing, it can make it harder to hear other sounds within that mix or in life. Um, so so divvying up the frequency axis among all these instruments so that the piano doesn't interfere with our ability to hear the vocal, so that the distorted guitar doesn't interfere with our ability to hear the buzz and rattle of the snare drum, that's, that's a big part of what we do in the timbre domain, in the frequency domain. We try to not let overlap happen in a way that's destructive to our ability to enjoy the tone of those instruments. And if... Sure. Uh, I was thinking about this a little bit uh, last night, not this morning, but last night when my brain was on, uh, to um, Air Traffic, which is a tune that you listen to a little bit, I think, with Bradford's videos. Air Traffic has a really good example in just the piano and the vocal. If you go back and listen to the, 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 the closely voiced piano part, her melody sits really where her right pinky is or her, the highest note that she's playing. So that chord, the chords that she's playing on piano basically spectrally live all just below where she's singing. Her melody note sits right on top of that chord, and if she had revoiced the chords so that the piano part were higher, it would totally interfere with her vocal. You, would, you couldn't hear the, the fragile, uh, beautiful tone of her voice because the piano would be competing for it. So that might be something that she as an artist finds intuitively. It might be something that Bradford as a producer helped her find technically, but it's the right answer to make sure that the vocal doesn't get masked by the piano. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend checking that out. Yeah. Now, I mean, sometimes there, there have been recordings where, uh, that I've listened to where there has been that overlap, but it's been a musical decision to have that overlap. Um, could you talk about maybe some situations where uh, an engineer, a producer, or a songwriter might want to have uh, that collision of frequencies uh, yeah. for a musical reason? Yeah, so I... I uh, you know, how much can we talk before I, I've oversimplified things too much? When I talk about the jigsaw puzzle of frequency and masking, that might make us think we, ne we have to prevent masking all the time, and that's simply not true. Sometimes you want masking to fuse things together. You can create sort of a meta instrument, a new texture of sound, if you can fool people in so that they don't know that underneath the horn is also an electric guitar a distorted, strangely modified electric guitar that plays with the horns and the net result is a synthesized, unnatural kind of horn. This happens all the time, by the way. A classic example is kick and bass are often thought of by an engineer uh, and a lot of composers. They're thought of as one instrument. And so every, every, almost every important note that the bass player plays will also have a kick drum right at the same time, and, and no one really cares if they're two instruments. We really want the attack of the kick drum and the sustained tone of the bass. So we are forever 
sort of merging those two into a single instrument. We're deliberately fusing them together. So that absolutely happens sometimes. Yeah. Great. So um, going back to your uh, original definition of sound itself and that it's air pressure moving, um, you know, air <clears throat> doesn't move nice and linearly in one small straight path. It, it exists uh, all around us. The sounds are in these, you know, these small spaces, these large spaces. It exists in space and moves around. Could you talk a little bit about how the space that sound exists um, uh, impacts the recording and production process? Yeah, that's the, though this makes me want to reiterate my first point. When, when our music lives in the studio, when we're creating it, space becomes a complete creative variable for us. That's one of the fun things about being in the recording studio is while Mahler and Beethoven had to deal with the space they had, they had a beautiful concert hall in which their, their symphonies were performed, we can put a vocal in a symphony hall and a piano can be anechoic in a really dry space and the drums can be in a medium club sized room. So for us, space is a creative variable. So we have to watch out because that power is easy to lose control of. That you can end up with, with a net multi-track mix that just has too much going on, too much to hear because you've had too many ideas about too many different spaces. So that self-correcting thing in nature when a band performs live, uh, that's really important for space because it, it uh, when all spaces are variables across a multi-track production, you can get into trouble fast. I speak from experience. Um, mm -hmm. So recognizing that, um, masking that idea that when one signal plays, it's harder to hear other signals, sp specifically other signals in that frequency range. One way to outsmart that is by using space. One way to make it easier to hear things that were conflicting before is to pan them to different locations. So by adjusting the pan pot so that we get the, the, the perceptual sense that one track is left and one track is right, that gives us also technically some release from masking. It makes it possible to now hear those two. A piano and a guitar playing the same part, if they're panned dead center, they, they might fuse together into an interesting new timbre and texture, but very often it just becomes sort of distracting and annoying to listen to. You can neither enjoy what the piano player is doing nor what the guitarist is doing if the parts are very similar, if they're playing in similar ranges. But if you pan them to new locations, now it's instantly easy to hear each of the parts independently and to enjoy them. But space isn't just left to right, for sure. Left to right is the easiest variable we have for ourselves in stereo. But if you can also have things near and far by adjusting artificial reverberation, that also is a release from masking. If you have a guitar and a piano playing very similar parts, but you can make it seem like the piano is very far behind the guitarist, then that's another release from masking. You can then enjoy both parts independently. So all of which sort of makes the point, when, when space is a creative variable, you need to recognize that it, it has a downside because things get messy. So I think you have to always get strategic. Why am I going to put the piano in a larger sounding space than the acoustic guitar? It can be simply for the art. It sounds beautiful that way but you should also be motivated by masking. Maybe it's easier to hear the full arrangement of what the band was trying to do, what the composer intended in this piece. Great. So could you talk a little bit uh, about just the, the technical, I mean, you, you started to allude to that, but the technical process, um, you know, you're there as an engineer or producer working with the musician or you're creating your own tune, and uh, what are the technical means or, or, or your processes of thinking that influence the technical means um, for making those decisions about should I have the piano further back uh, or further up or left and right? I mean, how do we, what are some, some, some practical techniques we can think about for how to make those decisions? Yeah, it's an it's a excellent question. First of all, it is, um, this is a creative endeavor. So, so you are allowed to follow your muse. If you have a crazy idea for something, you, you're absolutely allowed to try it and explore it, but listen carefully and make sure it's as effective as you want. Sometimes we get distracted by, gee whiz, isn't it cool, that crazy special reverberant effect I just put on the vocal, and you forget that you can't understand the vocal, and if no one can understand the words, you know, that should be a very deliberate intent, because not many people listen to songs where the words are a blurry mess. So, yes, follow your heart and, and try things, but we can reduce it to some practical things. If, if the pan pot is dead center, what that means is it's sending the same amplitude of that signal to both speakers or to both sides of your headphones. 
And the perceptual result of that is what we call the phantom image. And it's very compelling. It's not a trick. It's very real. If you're sitting between the speakers, or if your headphones are balanced left to right, they both, both speakers work, when you pan something dead center, the perceptual result is we feel like, it's very compelling, we feel like something's dead center. And there's no loudspeaker there. There's no headphone driver straight in front of you. At least, you're supposed to wear the headphones like this, not like this. I hope everyone knows. So that panning something dead center is really powerful as, a, as an illusion. And in fact, we probably put most of the energy of any mix, most of the total net energy of all the tracks go dead center. We usually think that the most important thing should go dead center. Vocal, kick, snare, bass almost always go dead center or very close to that. If you were to pan your vocal off to one side, you can do that. It is sometimes done, but if you listen to the history, our, you know, our whole inherited history of recorded art, the vocal is very rarely on the side. It's distracting, um, so it's a special attention-getting effect, but it's pretty distracting to leave it there. We almost always return it to center. It could be off to the side for one section of the tune and return to center. That makes sense as a dramatic effect. But, I mean, it's kind of practical. You have two speakers. Put the important things in both speakers so that no matter where anyone's sitting in the room, they have a good chance to hear the important stuff, the vocal, the kick, the snare, and the bass. So those things are almost always dead center. The... The next sort of decision point for me then is what to do with any instruments that can play chords. So harmony instruments, piano, guitar, a horn section, a string section, some synth things that you figured out, those now get to spread out left to right. And if you have multiple harmony instruments, one of the best things, uh, one of the important things to explore rather, uh, left to right, is a concept called spatial counterpoint. So you often like to get things on opposite sides uh, left to right that are interacting with each other. So if there's an interesting groove and it interacts with a slightly different groove on the other side, then you sort of get this motion across your mix where you feel like things are bouncing back and forth. So that kind of spatial counterpoint can be a reason to put things in opposite directions. And, and that ends up having some surprising, uh, there's some surprising pairings. Uh, and just to, just to show you the kind of trivia that experienced mix engineers obsess with, for um, for the styles of music I work most with, kind of pop, rock, and that sort of thing, um, it is it is 80% of the time, if there's an acoustic guitar, I will pan it to the opposite side of the hi-hat. And that's completely because of spatial counterpoint. The sort of thing that's going to happen on the hi-hat is often rhythmically very similar to, but not identical to, the strumming of an acoustic guitar. So if it's a rhythmic strumming acoustic guitar and a well-played hi-hat, pan them to the same location and they kind of rub against each other because they're not locked in perfectly. Pan them to opposite sides and they sometimes move together and sometimes don't and it's a interesting sort of spatial counterpoint. So now you get to whenever you're staring at a multi-track production, you, you sort of look for tracks that are similar and tracks that are very different and see if they can go together in the same location or if they're interesting panned left to right for that spatial counterpoint sort of idea. So to sum up, I think the most important things, this is really boring and practical, but the most important things are pan dead center. Vocal, kick, snare, and bass, almost always. Great. And then for those, that's for spreading it that way, and then it would be use of other effects, which we're going to have the fortunate, uh, we'll, we'll be fortunate to be able to talk in more depth about in a couple weeks when we have you back for another interview. Uh, but At 9 a.m. Other effects, yes. Other effects like reverb and things like that then to adjust uh, the placement of the sound front to back as well for that kind of counterpoint. Correct, yes. Great. So I guess um, to kind of wrap up this, this, this section, um, could you summarize then again, you know, some, some practical reasons why, you know, I mean, we're getting in here, the, our next uh, project that, that everybody here is currently working on uh, is, you know, applying a technique of critical listening and recording analysis to you know, one of their favorite songs, and if you have any tips or, or, or techniques or uh, just further context around um, what they should be doing in terms of approaching that, uh, that would be great to share. Absolutely. Uh, so I don't know if, if, if you have already or you currently are or will be looking at, at, a, at a tune and just identifying what instruments you're playing. That's an important exercise, uh, but I, I think it would be useful if you're also writing it down 
So literally making a grid of what, how many instruments are they, what are they, can you identify them? That's a good thing to do in a, in a stereo mix that you love. And then you identify when they're playing and importantly when they're not playing. So that sort of graph that shows you when they're playing, who's playing and when they're playing, uh, a producer and an engineer and a songwriter and a performer, that stuff is always in their head. And, and I can't listen to the radio without sort of noticing that. And when I hear a song for the first time, I'm taking in who's playing where and what's the song form and was the intro only three bars when I expected four and you're going to talk about song form and structure I think in, a, in the coming weeks. All that stuff, who's playing when and is it a verse and a half chorus, a verse and a full chorus, all that stuff, you need to have that sort of detailed knowledge of the track before you can ever mix it. The, the mix is going to get away from you. You won't know if you need to overdub another thing if you don't know this stuff. You won't know which microphone to put on the saxophone if you don't already know what you have room for in your mix based on the tracks already recorded. So that exercise of lo looking at who's playing and when they play, learning from uh, recordings that you like, which means they passed one test, which is you love that recording, then stare at the piece of paper where you've looked at that and notice how there often are crescendos. It'll start off with a simple arrangement and things will grow. You'll notice that there are change-ups. Up, change you know, there's a bridge where it strips back down to something smaller and then grows big again. Or maybe the whole song is just getting more and more complex. All of those are useful variables. There's no right answer for that. It's a creative expression. But I, just, I think you should notice that as blocks of sound, who's playing and when are they playing, you learn a lot from that. And you'll see that they've avoided getting losing control of that mix by turning things off, by choosing to replace one instrument with another instead of just adding an instrument, that sort of thing. So that detailed knowledge, track by track, bar by bar, that's in the head of everyone who was involved in that production. So you sort of have to develop that skill to learn to hear that way and to sort of store it in your mental RAM so that you know exactly what's going on in the third chorus. You know exactly what you can get away with. And I should say, by the way, um, that it's a lot of that's about masking. If you if you then look at who's playing and who's not, you sort of see how they figured out when it got too crowded and when it didn't. But another thing to recognize, we've been talking about the frequency axis a little bit. Every every instrument has its own timbre. Every instrument has its own distribution of energy from low to high for any note it plays. You know what separates a piano from a flute, from a violin, from a voice, even as they all play and sing the same musical pitch at the same level. What separates them is timbre, and that's a really complicated thing. But if you recognize the difference between a piano and a guitar, that's all well and good. You can also step back and listen to the whole mix. The entire mix has a timbre. And when you start looking at the blocks of sound that come and go, you'll notice that a tune might go for a while, and then it gets more low end suddenly. So it's not just that the bass came in late, but it's that the whole mix feels fuller now because it got low end. And the classic cliche of, you know, the Beatles did this all the time. If you don't know who the Beatles are, please Google them. Uh, but, you know, the tambourine that only happens in the last chorus, I think that's a timbral gesture. The chorus has happened several times. It's catchy. Everyone's singing along. And now there's a little bit more high end into it. It lifts. It has a spectral kind of crescendo. All they did was add some high frequency energy in the tambourine. So notice that timbre is a variable. You bring in low end, you take it away. You bring in high end and you take it away not just through tone controls and equalizers, but through the instruments you choose to have play and when you choose to have them play. Great. So I think that co covers uh, the basic topics that uh, I wanted to have you address here. Uh, and so at this point, um, I'd like to, uh, we have, uh, everybody is, uh, we have, I think we have over 50 people right now at least watching and uh, interacting. I have the, the chat room open here on our unhangout. And I'd like to open it up at this point uh, to questions from our live viewers. So uh, if you have any questions uh, or topics you'd like uh, Professor Case to address, uh, go ahead and uh, write them. We'll, 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 we'll give you uh, three minutes or so to write your questions. Uh, think about them. Put them here in the, um, put them in the chat window, and then we'll be able to uh, ask from there. So. Uh, Thank you again, uh, Alex, for, for all this. And we'll just uh, hang around here for a few minutes and see what questions come through. And uh, we'll go from there.
Well, we have one question uh, that came in again, um, and we did cover uh, we did cover the question at the beginning. Uh, but the question, maybe, maybe Alex, if you don't mind just giving a nutshell uh, description again, uh, Owen is asking, what is masking? So, so masking is the phenomenon where the presence of one signal makes it harder to hear another signal. And, and the idea of a mask, you know, if someone wears a mask, you can't quite tell who they are maybe. You know, Halloween wasn't too long ago for those of us who, who have that sort of strange holiday here in the States, we do. So the idea of a mask obscuring who someone is uh, at a masked ball, uh, that applies to sound. So when a piano plays, a piano which has spectral content that really covers the mids. So a, pian a lot of piano parts will have energy. Uh, I mean, obviously it depends on what they're playing, but it'll be full of energy from 200 hertz to 4,000 hertz. And anything else playing in that range is a little bit harder to hear or might become impossible to hear. So masking is that phenomenon where the presence of one signal makes it harder to hear another signal. Great. Uh, we have another question from Casey. Uh, and the question is about panning left to right. How far do you pan things? Uh, when do you pan 100% in either direction? So it is, that's a very good question. Um, Many experienced engineers, uh, this is going to be a disappointing answer, I think, for you, Casey. Many experienced engineers actually think of the pan pot as a three-position switch. It's hard left, it's hard right, or it's dead center. The, the, those illusions are really compelling. If you, if you pan something hard to the left loudspeaker, sorry, to the left loudspeaker, um, basically the signal only comes from the left loudspeaker, and anyone listening localizes towards the speaker where the sound is coming from. So if the sound comes from one speaker only, people will reliably be able to point to it and say it's coming from over there. If you pan it dead center, that illusion of something being exactly a phantom center image between those two speakers, that's a really wonderful and compelling illusion, but only if you're sitting between the speakers or only if you're wearing headphones. And if you go off center, as soon as you go off center, you no longer localize in the center. When you lean left or right, you localize the sounds panned dead center, you localize them towards the nearer loudspeaker, right? So a signal that's panned dead center, it's equal amplitude in the left and right loudspeaker. If you move your head a little bit to the left loudspeaker, you're just gonna, it's going to be louder at the speaker you're closer to, so you're going to think the signal's coming from there. So all of which is to say a hard pan position is a really durable effect. A phantom center is a really powerful effect. But things in between those are very subtle. And so an intermediate pan position, you can absolutely use it sometimes, but frankly, most of the time, we either hard pan or dead center pan the tracks. And then when it feels particularly crowded in one part of the arrangement, if it gets too crowded in the middle, we might start to pan things very slightly left and right. Or if it's too crowded at one part of the tune way over on the left loudspeaker, we might pull some of them in a little bit. But as starting mix moves, I, I use hard pan positions and dead center positions. Okay, great. Um, another couple question uh, in here. So uh, this is from Alessandro. Uh, in deciding on instrument placement, vocal placement in a space is you know trial and error. It, it, it just slipped through here. Let me bring it back up. Uh, let me get it back for Alessandro. Second. There we are. Um, is, is vocal placement in space uh, a, a trial and error process, or do you have a concept of where things should go before, beforehand? Um, yeah, there, there are a lot of ways to break that down. You might, as a goal, have the idea that you want to create a realistic illusion of what the band looks like if you're there. So you might think that the singer should be in front of the drummer and that the keyboarder should be off to one side. And, and you can assemble that sort of uh, that sort of loudspeaker simulation of reality. A lot of the time, probably most of the time, in at least in pop and contemporary pop styles of music, we, we abandon reality entirely and we just say, I have all these tracks, all these timbres, where where do they sound best? I don't have to create the illusion of a of a band arrangement. I can just I can pan them to locations that they wouldn't stand in live, but that sound good and fill the loudspeaker soundstage left to right. In that scenario too, though, the vocal is almost always the most important track. 
So the vocal is almost always dead center, and, and the vocal is almost always the loudest thing in the mix. This varies by genre, but I think it would be fair to say the loudest thing in the mix for most pop and rock styles anyway is vocal is loudest, snare is second loudest, though sometimes it's louder than the vocal, and then kick and bass come close. And then you, you mix the harmony instruments, the chordal instruments. You know, I, I, I hesitate to say guitar and keys because I don't want to rule out all those other instruments. Um, but those things, you just turn them up until they don't drown out the band, the singer, and the bass and the snare. You turn them down yeah. until you, you like that sort of balance. So the vocal is almost always the loudest. Uh, and also, you don't want the vocal to be obscured by reverberation. So it's pretty difficult in pop styles and music for the vocal to be really reverberant. It's pretty difficult to get away with a vocal being in, in in a large hall sort of reverberation or a house of worship sort of reverberation. The vocal is very often quite dry, which is to say it doesn't have a lot of reverberation on it. Or it has a kind of reverberation that I don't think we can talk about too much this time, but I, 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 I promise you we will in our next interview. Uh, we might use something called a plate reverb or a chamber reverb, and those reverbs are important usually because they're small and short, they don't obscure the vocal, and they have timbral benefits. So they don't, we use them not because they simulate space around the singer, but because they support the timbre. They make the vocal stronger, more interesting, more beautiful in tone, not space, ironically. So it's a timbral use of reverb. So, uh, so I would say perceptually try to keep the vocal in front of the whole band, in front of the whole mix. Make sure you can always hear what she's singing. Uh, and so that usually means louder and drier so that the illusion and pan dead center, so that the illusion is that singer is in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. And let the other instruments be more reverberant and further away. Great. Uh, another, uh, I'm seeing a, a common theme across a few different people, both Ant and Lisa and Orville has addressed it as well in here. But um, how do you measure or identify the frequencies of individual sounds and, and, and tracks? Um, are there tools for that? Um, are there techniques that, uh, that we could we could find or, or tools we could find so that we could better identify and see where the energy is uh, frequency wise. So I would I would bump that question a little bit back to you, uh, Alex, to know what tools they might have available to them uh, in this course if it's in some of the online tools you have. But the the answer to the question is it's a it's a lifelong journey. Uh, recording engineers probably for the first five years of our career. We're, we're still learning to hear out the frequency axis accurately. And, and it takes a long time to sort of learn when you hear a piano how low is low and how high is high within that piano. And so it, it, it truly, it's, uh, you study it for a long time. One of the ways you learn to hear it is if you have an equalizer. And, and so if the digital audio workstation is going to have an equalizer and if you're going to allow them to do that in mm -hmm. the coming weeks. Yep. Uh, and I know when I teach... Uh, mixing at the college level, I still deny my students the equalizer for a while. So I'm very mean about when I green like that, but at some point you'll be allowed to use some other effects in this course. Those are a chance to learn frequencies. So you can dial in a boost of some amount and scan around with the frequency select knob on the equalizer. If, if you've never used an EQ, you of course have no idea what I'm talking about, but when you do use an equalizer, it's going to be completely intuitive to you from the beginning. So you, you, you basically, it's like shining a light on something. You're basically going to boost and then change the frequency and listen. And you'll, as you sweep that frequency up and down, you'll find spectral regions of the piano that get louder. And you'll say, ah, I hear that the piano lives in that frequency range. And then as you sweep that frequency lower and lower and lower, you'll notice that you don't hear anything happening in the piano as you do this boost, which might tell you for this piano part, there's not much low frequency content down there. You do that for a human voice, you'll quickly learn there's not much in a male voice below 100 hertz, a female there's not much below 200 hertz, and the consonants live around three to 4,000 hertz. This is all just sort of the trivia that fills, that clutters my mind because I, I've, I've been recording vocals, analytically thinking about vocals for way too long. So you start to learn vowels live low, consonants live in the mids, and you, you learn that the highest frequency thing in the drum kit's actually the hi-hat most of the time. You'll start to over time learn what frequencies are occupied by which instruments. But it's, a, it's truly a lifelong journey. It's hard, it's really hard to hear that out. It's right. a risky analogy, but uh, most of us, if you're, if you're not colorblind in some way, most of us can uh, look at a wall and see it's blue, it's yellow, it's white. Um, and we don't really do that with sound, but recording engineers do. I don't mean to say we associate color with it. Some people do. 
but I'm more just when I hear a low frequency, I know what frequency range it lives in. When I hear a mid frequency, I know what frequency range it lives in. Um, sure. But I had to learn that. It's not it's not part of how society interacts with each other. Yeah, and there um, just to the point here, some people are putting some great uh, links in the discussion here where. Uh, uh, somebody mentioned Transcribe, uh, and that's also been posted on the Google Plus community. Uh, there's some other links in here um, where you can, uh, there's uh, frequency and spectrum analysis software where you can start to see and play around with uh, different timbres. So that's not something we are providing specifically for the course, but there's a lot of resources out there uh, to do that. Um, a few more questions here. Uh, there's a, a question again, uh, just, and it would, would be probably helpful to clarify. Um, here, just a quote here from Fred. Uh, let me grab the question here again. Uh, there it is. You talk about front to back, but I, I and most people listen in stereo, not four channel. Or do you mean the relative volume in the mix? Could you just be a little bit more specific than Alex about how how do we how do we hear in the uh, front to back as well as left to right? Yeah, thank you. You caught me. I uh, I, I I think I misspoke. I'm only speaking of stereo here. And so left to right is easy to do in stereo. Front to back is an illusion we still try to create with stereo. So if, uh, if a signal has less reverb than another signal, we could, and also you talked about volume in that question. That's a good point. If something's turned down, if you turn it down, it starts to seem further away. If you make it more reverberant, it starts to seem further away. And so we actually really, it's hard to do, but we explore the front back dimension even with stereo loudspeakers by by adjusting level and by adjusting the relative amount of reverb. And there is another side to this that um, uh, is probably not beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, which is um, air absorption. Air absorbs high frequencies more than mid frequencies, more than low frequencies. And so a sound that's further away from you also is a little bit duller. It has a little bit less high end than a sound that's very close to you. Think of a whisperer when someone's very close to your ear. You hear all kinds of very high frequency detail that gives it away. It tells us that person's really close to our ear. If someone's further away, that high frequency stuff is attenuated, and it's because of the physics of air. It's absorbed those high frequencies. The further away you are, the more the balance of the tone shifts towards mids and lows. So if you want to push the front to back dimension, you have three levers. One is you turn it down. Things that are further away are quieter. The other is you adjust the relative level of reverberation to dry signal. Things that are further away typically have more reverb than, than things that are closer. And lastly, you could do a, and this, is, this takes guts because it, it, it uh, doesn't sound right at first, but if you could do a gentle amount of high frequency roll off on a track, that will also perceptually push it further and further away. So gentle roll-off, more reverb, and low level will give you some depth. And, you know, if, if these concepts are, are, are new to you, we will be covering these in much more depth in weeks three and four uh, about the specifics of how to do that and to work with those frequencies using audio effects such as equalization and reverb with that. Um, there's a couple other quick questions along the way. Um, Atria asks, do you mix first or pan first? Um, yeah, neither. Um, the the I, I would call it balancing a mix. This important first step of a mix uh, when you're pushing up the faders and setting the pan pots, that actually is really important to the ultimate success of this mix. Experienced mix engineers can do it fairly quickly. If you're new to it, it's really difficult. The idea that the level of the drums is totally under your control, the level of the vocal is completely under your control, that's a lot of power and it's easy to get, get it wrong. What a drummer, a guitarist, a bass player, and a singer will figure out live when they're in the same room together, they'll all make sure they can be heard. But if you just have faders controlling the independent level of these, you can get things very wrong, or you can also, it's an opportunity, you can create things that sound better than the band could ever do live. But it's not easy. So this idea of balancing the mix, raising the faders to levels that make musical sense so that you can hear the full counterpoint of what the band is trying to do, and included in that, at the same time, in my mind, is panning. So pushing right. up faders, panning them, I explore it, basically. I pan some things left and right. I try, I try different ideas to see how is the kazoo going to fit with the didgeridoo and all of these things. Uh, you, it comes through trial and error. And to, I, I think it's a mistake to push up faders first and then pan them and think of them as independent gestures, because while that can be educational at first, uh, anything that goes from center to hard panning almost always it becomes easier to hear. 
So a, a panning out gesture is almost always accompanied by a turn it down a little bit because it got easier to hear. So so I'm always coaxing faders up and down and moving pan pots left to right and to center, trying to figure out what makes sense of this arrangement. Guided by, though, I still stand by this, that the most important stuff is dead center, vocal, kick, snare, and bass. Uh, I might try panning them, but they're really dead center or close to center in 95% of all projects I've worked on. So I hope that answers Great. the question. I hope so, too. <laughs> we have another question from Chris, which is, how do the acoustics of a room affect how you would mix your sound? Yes. Um, part of why I made it my life's journey to study acoustics, too, is because I want to understand all the things with, that, that, frankly, that interfere with our ability to make the music we want to make. The room is a part of it when you're recording the music, and the room, as you point out, is a part of it when you're mixing the music, when you're making critical decisions. And so we... I basically have two kinds of listening environments. The recording studio, I kind of want it to be a microscope. I want it to be really accurate. I want it to be as revealing as possible from low to high and beautifully flat in the mid so that I can hear the exquisite difference between two guitars when a guitarist says, I can play this Martin acoustic or I can play this Taylor acoustic and should I change the strings? Those are high level decisions you need to be able to make only by having an accurate view of things. So the the control room sort of environment that you need to create for yourself, it can be headphones. They should be the best headphones you can manage. If you have loudspeakers, you should, frankly, you should get the best loudspeakers and power amps you can manage and try to put it in a room where the room isn't too reverberant, where the room doesn't have too many distracting reflections because what you're trying to do is hear what's in the loudspeakers. However, for fun listening, so when I'm not being the mix engineer and I just want to listen to music and have fun, then, then I don't need the speakers to be accurate. It's okay if they have a little extra low end to make the, the bass pump a little more, or like a little extra high end to make the mix shimmer. So the sort of living room system can be different from the control room system. The control room system is often a very... And when I say control room, I mean the space where you're going to make your decisions about your tracks. That needs to be a flat, accurate, revealing environment as best you can muster. Great. So there's another uh, more, more basic question. I've seen a lot of people plus one this. It's a question from Aaron. Where would you recommend absolute beginners start? Um, let me go back up here. Yes. Uh, with sound engineering. So, for instance, as in, are there, are there particular fundamentals that should be practiced before diving in and trying to mix? Hmm. Um, the, the structure, is, as I understand it, and in, in, in play with your music, uh, is actually a really great way into this. The, I, I think we're all very tempted to, to literally play with our music, to create things, make mixes, and share them with each other and enjoy them. And of course you should be doing that. But you'll notice designed into this uh, MOOC is a lot of analysis of works by others. That is going to really help you in your production. Uh, so taking a mix that we hope it's done well, so probably taking a release that's been done by people uh, with some rep reputation, with some track record of success, and analyzing as much as you can their mixes and what they've done. If you haven't thought about panning as a creative variable, go listen to what other engineers have done with the vocal, with the piano, and so on. Um, so studying and analyzing uh, other mixes is a really good way to start, a really good place to start. It's maybe not as much fun, but it's a really good place to start because then you can imitate others with your tracks. So you have an idea for tracks. It has a similar arrangement to the music you love. So you would imitate them, pan them to the same position, set up the same relative level of bass, bass versus snare versus vocal and so on. Okay. So learn from others. Uh, we have another question that was asked earlier, which I wanted to kind of get through some of those specific questions before we zoomed out here. Uh, but how do you know when a piece is done? <laughs> it's never done. Uh, I, don't, I don't know anyone who uh, has finished a mix and doesn't hear it the next day or the next week or the next year and, and think of things they might do sli slightly differently. And I think artists feel this way. Uh, they, they write a song, they play a song, they play it out and they react, they get the crowd reaction and they tweak the words, they change the melody, they go into the studio and record it. I think that's just a snapshot of a constantly moving target. 
that the artist is going to sing it differently next time and they're going to want to add piano where it had been guitar next time. And, and so I think most artists feel about their music that it's never done. They're always playing with it and trying new ideas. And the same is true in the studio. We're, we're going to finish a mix so that we can upload it so that people can download it. That's all true, but we're constantly eager to change it. We want to try other things. So a little bit, you just have to let it go. Practical things is what makes you stop mixing. I'm out of time. I should eat. I should sleep. I should go see if I have any friends left in the world. So that that's what makes you step away from the mixer. And every time you do, every time you've bounced that mix to the disc and, and sent it out to your, to your people, uh, you still want to take it back and try one more thing. It's never done. You have to sort of convert that into, well, that's fun. I'm glad it's never done. I'm constantly hungry. I'm constantly curious. I'm constantly getting better ideas. That's just, I think that's part of this gig, frankly. Great. Uh, there's another uh, technical, more technical question that was asked earlier from Glenn. Is it important to listen, and we haven't really talked about this explicitly, so maybe you could bring this up. Is it important to listen to your mix in mono? Yes, um, for a few reasons. So going, if you can, if you can set it up so that it's easy enough to do to listen in mono and stereo and go back and forth, uh, that can be revealing. One reason is that a lot of people listen in mono. Telephones are mono. Uh, well, telephones have one speaker. If you know, I walk by people all the time listening to their phone. It breaks my heart, right? We've been mixing. We spend three days on a on a mix trying to get the bass right, and then people listen on a phone which has nothing below, you know, 250 hertz, so they can't hear my bass. Why won't, why won't they go listen on speakers? So, um, so why would we listen in mono? Well, a lot of people do listen in mono, and you may not know this, but uh, FM radio, the way the standard was designed for FM radio, some of you don't know what radio is, I realize this, but a lot of people, my vintage, listen to the radio, and the way FM radio is designed is you get further and further away from the station, it doesn't just cut in and out, uh, it collapses to mono. So they actually broadcast uh, in a way that the mono portion of the signal lasts longest. And frankly, most people driving in the car are listening to mono and aren't aware of it. They designed it that way so that, imagine if when the radio station breaks up, if the left channel just kept going on and off. That would be really distracting. So they made it so it would go from stereo to mono, which is a more subtle shift. So if you think you're going to get heard on the radio, your mix has to sound killer in mono. So... Uh, so for internet broadcast, that doesn't matter anymore, but for people driving around listening to terrestrial radio and digital radio, it absolutely does matter. So you want your mix to be effective in mono. Uh, so listening in mono and, go, and going back and forth between stereo and mono lets you uh, know that your mix still works in mono. Moreover, it helps you evaluate the decisions you're making about stereo. So if you toggle back and forth between mono and stereo, you can sort of decide, does it sound okay that the tambourine is off to the side? If you go back and forth between mono and stereo and you you did something bold like panned your vocal off to the side, I think you might chicken out, and I hope you do. You might say, wait, it's a little weird that the vocal's off to the side. When I hear it in mono, it makes more sense than in stereo. So I'm going to bring the vocal back to the center. So you can evaluate your panning decisions uh, by going back and forth between mono and stereo. Great. We have another question here from Bob about... How does one work around known hearing loss in specific frequencies? A, a, a lot of, um, I would say that most recording engineers, most musicians, frankly, have, have some partial hearing loss. A lot of famous mix engineers have been listening unhealthily loud for too long, but their mixes still sound great. So uh, a, a little bit of hearing loss uh, is, an, is not a deal breaker at all. Uh, if you've been in a room with a drum kit, you probably have hearing loss if you didn't have hearing protection. So if you're in a band, we were probably almost all of us were in bands, or almost all of us have gotten into the music and turned it up too loud. We might have damaged our hearing. Don't do that. Practice good hearing health going forward. Uh, wear earplugs at loud concerts and don't listen too loud when you're working. Turn, don't let your headphones get too loud. Sorry, I have to issue all these disclaimers. Protect your hearing health going forward. But if you have some tinnitus, some tinnitus, some ringing in your ear, or if you have known hearing loss, it's great that it's known. You can almost always just work through it. You can, you can guess what's going on in the frequency ranges you can't hear as well by listening above it and below it, or by not doing anything too radical in those frequency ranges. Frankly, a lot of people work um, on pretty small loudspeakers, loudspeakers that don't have much sound power below 60 hertz. A lot of mixes in the 80s uh, were done on Yamaha NS10s, which don't have much energy below 80 hertz. And 
all those mixes sound full and wonderful down low, and it's because the recording engineers, even though they couldn't hear what was going on down low, they had good intuition about what was going on down low. They didn't overdo anything. They didn't push it too hard down there. So for the frequency ranges where you can't hear because of your loudspeaker system or because of known hearing loss, just don't get too aggressive in those ranges. Trust that if, you, if things are smoothly um, well-behaved across that range, uh, or up to that range, high or low, uh, you can trust that it probably sounds great through the range that you can't hear. Great. So, just scanning through the the, the comments here, there's a lot of great um, there's a lot of great discussion here, and we'll be archiving that. Um, but I guess uh, I'm not seeing uh, any any brand new questions here. A lot. I think you've you've been able to cover quite a bit here, and we're approaching the the hour mark here. So. I guess I'd like to just finish by uh, turning it back over to you. Uh, and do you have any closing advice or thoughts uh, now that you've kind of, you know, you've, you've had your interview and you've had some questions from the, from the live audience. Um, anything that you would like to leave us with uh, going forward? Sure. Uh, I'll try not to be too much of a downer and say that, uh, that what, the, what the recording engineer brings to uh, a multi-track production is, might be surprisingly more practical than you think at first. A lot of what recording engineers do is fix problems. We, we sort of look for things, common problems that we've heard before, and we tend to them. We fix them. And another sort of humble, practical thing recording engineers do is that sort of dealing with masking, of fitting things together. And, and both of those aren't particularly creative. Fixing things and fitting things together, that's really tactical. That's really analytical, and, and it's necessary. But that's us as recording engineers being, you know, the accountants of music. It's sort of boring. Uh, well, it's not boring. It's fun, and it's really important. But I just want you to recognize how, how that's sort of, we're the carpenters. We're the accountants. We're making sure it stands up and it doesn't fall down. But, but fixing and fitting things together is a lot of what we do. And, and, and only, only after those things are done should you get to the fun, creative part that I call feature in, in my book, uh, Mix Smart. Fix, fit, and feature is sort of the way I organize the world. Once you fix the known problems and you fit things together tactically, then you get to get creative and say, I'm going to feature elements of this mix that I like. So this is when I dial in the special effect, the echo that repeats in, in tempo with the music and so on. So I, I guess I would say defer the fun part, defer the feature, the really creative, wacky stuff. Defer that in your process and make sure you've got this other stuff happening first. So the point I'm trying to make is a lot of what we do is kind of practical and necessary and structural, and then we get to the creative, wacky, special effects, special sauce, fun stuff. If you do it in that order, I think you'll find your mixes are a lot more successful. Great. Uh, well, I, I just want to thank you again for uh, taking the time to be with us and share. Uh, I've had a great time uh, with this interview, and just for the people listening, uh, this interview will be posted to our YouTube channel and back out to the course uh, so that you can watch it, re-watch it, um, and, and, and answer as you go. I would also encourage that if you have technical questions or musical questions or even just want to continue the discussion, please uh, do that within your learning ensembles within the course, but also feel free to go over to the Google Plus community uh, and share your experiences there. Um, you know, one of the great things with having a lot of you taking this course is that all each of you brings uh, a own, you, your own unique set of experiences and expertise, and we want to encourage you to also share what you know and your experiences and links to tools and the tips and the songs that you found. So please take the time to share as well. I mean, we're here all learning together, and that's, you know, the core concept here behind Play With Your Music, because we want you to get inside, to be curious, to explore the roles of production and engineering, and um, to share your passion for the music that you love. So uh, with, with that, I'll say uh, thank you again very much, Alex. It's been a pleasure to have you here today. A pleasure for me as well. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. And we'll see you all on uh, online with the rest of Play With Your Music. Have a great day.